All right, I have a treat for you today. I'm out here at my dad's house. We're gonna go in, we're gonna take a look at his collection. You're gonna meet him. He's the one that got me into cars and he's the reason that I like the cars that I do like. So let's go inside, meet him, and we'll show you his collection. I told him I was coming. Let's see what he's doing. This is my dad, Al. He's the one that got me into cars. He's been working on cars since I was a kid. And this is your little shop here at your house, right? Yep. You want to show us around? Sure. Yeah, so this is my workshop in my garage. I got all kinds of thing in, things in here. I've been working on my lawnmower, getting it ready to mow grass. And got a few cars in here I've been working on as well. So what do you want to see, Steve? Well, let's start over here. We've got an old farm all. This was your dad's tractor. And I think you used this when you were a kid, right? Yeah, uh, when I started driving tractors in the early 1960s, uh, this was one of the two tractors that my dad had that I spent a lot of hours on. And um, he sold it to a guy back in the 1970s. And uh, in the 19, well, no, it was about. 2011, I managed to uh, buy it back and restore it, and Steve's shop did the bait work, and I did all the mechanical work. And over here we have, uh, this is a tiger, my very first tiger. I bought this car and it was red when I got it. I probably had this car for eight years, eight to 10 years maybe. I uh, took it apart, repainted it the correct Commodore blue, and uh, when I got the Tiger that I drove over here today, I ended up selling this one to my dad. What, that was two or three years ago, probably. Yeah. And I took the engine out of it. Uh, it had been rebuilt before, but I resealed it. And, and uh, I took it into Steve's shop and had the trunk and the, the engine compartment painted the original color because they had been painted black when it had been changed to a red car. So I basically, it's pretty much restored to a, a stock uh, factory condition, or pretty close to it. It looks like you have your Shelby GT350 on the left right now. What are you doing? Yes, I put new wheel hubs on it. Uh, it was basically maintenance. We use this car once a year for a Shelby Club event at uh, Road America. So I was doing the maintenance, preparing it for, uh, to take it up to the track again this summer. Both Steve and I, trade off driving this car at the track and, and another Mustang that we take up there. And then over here is your trailer. You're uh, putting a new transmission in this one? Right, I, I pulled the old transmission out because things weren't shifting right and uh, I fixed that, but after that I decided, you know, it'd be nice to have a five-speed transmission in this car. So I've ordered a Tremec five-speed and I'm gonna put that in a hydraulic clutch in the car. You have a 427. It's, yeah, this was a, there is an original Fairlane GT that had, would have had the 390 cubic inch engine, but the previous owner had restored it with a uh, 427 cubic inch engine. Why didn't you get a Fairlane? Um, I never had a Fairlane or a mid-sized Ford before. Uh, I always thought these really looked nice. Of course, this is the year I graduated from high school, so I saw these driving around when, when I was a young kid. So this is what they call the 427 Sidewheeler? Yes. So, yeah. yes. And you want to explain to people why they called it the Sidewheeler? Uh, that was a second generation of the 427 that had better durability as far as oiling the uh, crankshaft, I believe. Um, now this engine, it does have the dual four barrel carburetor set up. But it's not a solid lifter cam like the uh, the original 425 horsepower 427. It has a it has a hydraulic cam, so this uh, this doesn't rev as fast. Uh, uh, would not put out as much horsepower. It's more of a, a street drivable engine than the the 427s, which were uh, pretty radical back in their day. So you have the vintage air setup on here. Do you have any other modifications? That's not standard. Uh, other than the engine, that's about it, and of course uh, about to be uh, the transmission and the hydraulic clutch. But other than that, it's uh, it's uh, pretty much a stock car. Now we'll go into the next room, and that's where he keeps the majority of his cars. It's just a, a storage room. This is kind of, the room that we're in right now is just a workshop where he works on the cars. So we'll go next door now. 
this is a Fiat 850 Sport Spider. Uh, why do you have this car? Well, I had one of these uh, just after I got out of college. Uh, uh, when I got out of college, I was driving a Chevelle SS 454. Very nice car, did, got very poor gas mileage, and I wanted something to drive around town. Did my first uh, job out of college, so I was looking for something small and found one of these and uh, found out it was a fun little car to drive, although not a very reliable car, so I only had it a couple of years. Now the old one that you had, you took that to your dad's farm and you repainted that. That was the first car that you had painted, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. It was a green car and I like red cars. You can see what color this car is. And I did a, like over a long weekend, I did a repaint job, which was a very bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a look under the hood. I think I remember you telling me you were at work one day and uh, this box here caught on fire when it was in the parking lot or something. Not not this car, but the original one that you had. Yeah, that was actually one of the reasons for, for repainting it. Uh, while I was in work one day, for some reason, the voltage regulator that's right there decided to burn itself up and it, it heated the paint and, and burnt a, a spot on the uh, back lid here burnt the paint off. So that was one of the reasons I decided to try to repaint it. It's uh, it's one of these, they're fun to drive, but on the highway to pass a car, you gotta plan ahead. You gotta, you gotta drop back and then put your foot on the floor and get up close and then pull out and see if you can pass or not. But at least this does have a five-speed transmission, right? Um, no, I think it's a four-speed. I think it's a five-speed. Is it? Are you sure? <laughs> There's six places to go, I guess, so it must be. Uh, another nice thing about this car is these have a hard tonneau cover here, so when you put the convertible top down, you pop this over it and you have a true roadster look, which is really a neat thing. And another thing on these cars is uh, the convertible top is very easy to put up. This is not like the British cars where you have to park and erect a convertible top for 25 minutes before you can drive off. You Literally, just pop the cover up, you reach back with one arm, throw it up, and the top is up. It's really a really enjoyable car to drive. Yeah, I always thought that was a very nice feature compared to a car like the English cars. <laughs> so behind the Fiat over here is a 1968 Mustang GT convertible. You've had this car a long time. Yeah, I believe this is the first car that I bought at a Mecham auction and uh, this car uh, was not an original GT um, and it had been I found that after I bought it it had been extremely rusty so I did a bunch of work on it it's a good driver car it's one you can drive without worrying about paint chips because it doesn't have the greatest paint job in the world but it's it's a nice looking car and it it drives nice it's uh, 302 cubic inch with a four-speed transmission. And I think when you were working on this car, uh, you've got a 67 Mustang, which we'll see a little bit, little bit later, but these two cars were the first cars that I saw what a real restoration took uh, when you were working on these. It, you know, you haven't painted this car, but you've touched mostly everything else on it. Uh, you had done the floors on this, and I think this was one of the first times I saw how much work it really is to fix up a car that has pretty major issues like this one did. Yeah, I, I pulled the engine out of the transmission, rebuilt the engine, completely redid the engine compartment. The rear frame rails were bad, so I, uh, I took those out and, and uh, spot welded in new, new frame rails. It was, it was a lot of work to make this car structurally and, and operationally sound. Let's take a look under the hood. So this car has a 302 V8. Uh, again, aftermarket modern air conditioning on it. If you had to take one of your old Mustangs for a drive, is this the one that you would take out? Yeah, if I just want to go for a leisure, leisurely drive, this is the one that I, that I use for those kind of things. And why this one when you have all these other ones? It's just fun to drive in and you know, you don't have to worry about 
you know, potentially nicking it up or anything like that. Uh, you know, it's not, considering it has been a very rusty car at one point in time, it's, it's not a highly valuable car. So we might as well just move on to the car next to it. This is a 1953 Ford truck. And uh, you drove a 53 Ford in high school, right? Uh, yeah, when I was in high school, um, my dad had a 1953 F-250, uh, which is a size larger than this F-100. It, it happened to be the same, exact same color and the exact same drive line as this one. This has the flathead Ford V8. This was the last year of the flathead V8 uh, in new vehicles and has the 303 transmission. So this is the original flathead for this truck, correct? Yes. These trucks actually have a lot of power. They're a lot faster than a lot of the trucks of this age that I've driven. When these vehicles came out, do you think that a lot of people preferred the trucks with the V8s or was the six cylinders good enough for most tasks? Uh, six cylinders were pretty popular back then. Um, of course, my dad's truck being an F-250 and it had a grain bed on it, which could call could haul 100 bushels of grain that weighed 6,000 pounds. The V8 was was pretty handy, but uh, sixes were pretty darn popular in cars and trucks back in those days. The truck that your dad had wasn't it uh, actually a livestock bed that was converted to a grain bed, or was it vice versa? Did he use it was the a, grain bed for livestock? It was a steak bed truck and had been ordered by a furniture company in my hometown and a tree fell on the, the cab and, and bent it up and the furniture company didn't want it. So my dad bought it and then he filled in the spaces between the boards on the side of the stake truck to make it a grain into a grain bed. And it's interesting that that truck had problems with the doors coming open on bumpy roads, whereas this truck has a much more straight and solid cab than that truck did. Well, behind me is uh, probably my favorite car. This is a Sunbeam Tiger that you've owned for my, oh, more than my whole life. You've owned this quite a bit, uh, longer than I've even been born. Yes, I bought it in July of 1972, so it'll be coming up on 49 years. Uh, this is the only uh, car that I've had anywhere near that number of years. And when you bought this car, this car was still the original red, not this red. That's correct. And yes. which red was this? It was the uh, Carnival red, which is kind of an orangish red. And you, you took this all apart and you did the body work and you, uh, did, did you paint this yourself too? No, I didn't paint it. I did strip the car down completely, strip off the original paint, uh, fix the rusty spots, uh, wasn't terribly rusty, but it had a few rust holes through it. Kind of an amateur job, but uh, then I did, uh, you know, the body work with uh, body filler and so on, and basically took it to a professional, a shop that did painting, a regular body shop, and they painted it for me. And you drove this car as your daily driver for a few years? Yeah, a couple of years before I started tearing it down to hot rod it and, and restore the body. And then after that, you would race this car? I took it to some track events, uh, the Shelby Club event that we go to every year that's, being, that's gone on since 1976, I believe. I took it to the first two of those events, and then I skipped a few years and took it again a couple of times. and Did some autocrossing. Actually, no, I guess I had restored it before I did any autocrossing, so I, I did some autocrossing many years ago before you were born. So basically, since it's had this paint job, you've only taken it to tracks mostly. Right. Yeah, it's, I modified it enough that it, it wasn't, it wasn't a car, a, a car to just go out and do a leisurely drive like the white Mustang over there. Well, I think it had 108,000 when I got it, but it was only, what, seven years old at that time. But since then, it's been almost all the rest of the years in, in a garage. It's never, it's never had to sit outside. So one of the reasons I always love this car is this car is extremely fast, being that you built it to go fast on the track, and it's also extremely loud. Let's take a look at the engine. What have you done up here? 
Well, uh, unfortunately, I didn't realize the value of an engine, original engine, so I threw the original 260 away. I think I actually took it to the local auto scrapyard and said, here, do you want that engine? And they did take it. Um, I, I got a 289 high-performance engine from a speed shop that had been in a 63 Fairlane drag car and they were changing to, to a different engine. So I bought that used engine, rebuilt it and put it in this car because it's physically the same size as a 260. And uh, initially I had too far radical a cam. It was basically a drag race cam. So and it wouldn't, you know, it didn't stay cold. So on a hot day, it was about impossible to drive around town. I've rebuilt the engine a couple of times since then um, and tamed it down a lot. So uh, um, it's it's still a pretty pretty powerful engine, but it's uh, it's um, it's still not super streetable as far as going and taking a, a leisurely drive. You drive this car if you want to go fast. I remember. You taught me how to drive a manual transmission in this car. This might have been the only manual transmission car that you had at the time, but uh, would we would take this out and you let me. I, I think we probably practiced in the parking lot at first, but then you would let me uh, drive you around in this. And then after that, uh, you signed me up for autocrosses, and my first autocrosses that I did were in this car as well. And I, then I think eventually you got your 66 Mustang and we were taking both cars to autocrosses for a while. Yeah, I think that's right. He's playing the 41 41.83. You were taking this car to track events before I was born, and then when I was born, you still did a few of those uh, the next few years. Yeah, I did. I did. I think I did two around 83 or 84 when you would have been four or five years old type of a thing. Yeah. And I think you stopped until I was 18, I think, and then, yeah, you started taking me to track stuff and take me out on the track and then eventually let me start driving a car on the track as well. Right. Was it uh, two, yeah, it was two years ago we we took, uh, well Steve took, well, you took your Harrington Alpine, I took this car and then the Blue Tiger that we just saw to uh, to a, uh, a Sunbeam event up in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. And when you put the new engine in it, you must have replaced all the instrumentation on the dashboard with Stuart Warner units? Yeah, I put, uh, I took the dashboard out and glued in some inserts because it needed smaller holes for some of the Stuart Warner gauges. And, and then I, I covered the, the dash with uh, that same black hog, naga hide uh, material that uh, I uh, covered the top of the dash and the dash and door panels and so on. So you did something pretty interesting back here. I think you did this after I was old enough to start going to track events with you and you put a ton of steel here in the back of the car and you kind of tied it in where the spare tire would be held down to the trunk floor. Why, why did you do that? Yeah, um, I had kind of forgotten about that, but I think that's like 130 pounds of iron that I put all the way in the back because tigers are very light on the rear and heavy on the front. And I did that before I took this to the Tulsa Shelby Club event in 2001, the um, year after I wrecked the Blue Mustang that's right over there up at, uh, up at Elkhart Lake. So, and it did, it did balance the car out as far as, it made the car heavier, obviously, so it would reduce acceleration, but it did, uh, make the car more balanced as far as having better, more weight on the rear and, let, and it actually takes some weight off of the front tires. And I've shared a video of me racing this car out on track before and this is one of the most fun cars that I have ever driven on the racetrack. But one issue that the, the car does have still is that the tires still rub here on the back. So if we ever take it to a track event, we'll have to figure that out sometime. But this this car is just, Awesome, and I think I took you for a ride out there a couple times, and 
And like you thought I was crazy the way that I was driving it. <laughs> yeah, Steve drives a little harder than I do. So if you want to check out that video, click right here. Next to the Tiger, we have a Boss 302 Laguna Seca. This is one of the modern Mustangs that you had bought that you started to do NASA Tron trials with. Yes, that was that was correct. This is the this is the first car that I did time trials with. Right behind us, we can see a 1966 Ford Mustang Fastback. Uh, this one's a real GT. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And you you actually bought this car when I was in high school, and you started doing some model crosses with this, and then eventually you started taking this to the road tracks and. Uh, you were originally, I think, trying to keep it pretty stock because a, a fastback, even at that time, was a pretty valuable car. And then you had a little incident at Road America, and I guess that gave you the ability to go a little bit more extreme with the car. Yeah, now this is an original 289 high performance car. It was a California car. I bought it from a, a classic car dealer in the Chicago area. And after I bought it, I realized, holy cow, this thing is totally rust-free. I've never seen an old car like this here in the Midwest. It did not have a correct 289 high-performance engine. The original engine was gone. So I had a Shelby uh, restoration stop shop up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, find me a, a correct uh, vintage 289 high-performance, built it up. It has lots of power. and. Uh, after I crashed it at Road America in 2000, hit a concrete wall and spun and slid backwards to a stop against the wall. Then I had it, I had the, the body rebuilt and then I put an aftermarket front suspension on it and rack and pinion steering, which made it turn better than the stock suspension. And I did a little, I put a watts link on, on the rear end. So this is actually a, a you've driven it, Steve. It's a, it's a pretty, Certainly doesn't have the power that some of these new cars have, but this is this is a pretty fast car for an old Mustang on the track. You, uh, it, for those people who are familiar with Road America, you crashed just after the kink, and luckily you're okay, but you actually hit so hard that your ribs put a big dent in the door panel, didn't you? Yeah, my, my left ribs dented the metal door panel. <laughs> Apparently they weren't broken, but they hurt really bad that evening. And we take a look under the hood. Sure. So you can see that you've done coilovers here, but you haven't removed the shock towers. You've kept that pretty original. Yes, this car could be returned to stock original if somebody uh, wanted to do that. I have no desire to do it at this point in time. This is a I, I really do like this car as far as my Mustangs. It's it's really my, my top favorite one. It's I'll take it out and drive it once in a while, but because uh, it's fun to drive because it's fast, but it's it's not the car to go out and take a leisurely drive like the the uh, Must uh, 68 convertible. So you had Jim Coles build this engine up for you. What modifications do you have here? Uh, well, of course, it has headers, it has aluminum high-rise manifold and a poly carburetor. It's got a solid lifter cam, so it uh, it revs uh, on the track. Up at Road America, I'll actually uh, reach the, on the main straight, I'll reach the 7,000 RPM uh, red line that I like to keep the engine speed to before I, before I get to the end of the straight, so I'm actually speed limited by the... Uh, the RPM. I'm uh, sure we've had this car on the dyno. Do you remember when it makes it to rear wheels? Um, I th think it was close to 300 at the rear wheels, yeah, which means it's probably around 350 engine flywheel horsepower. So that, this is definitely one of my favorite Mustangs that you own as well. I mean, you've had this thing since I was in high school. It's really fun to take this car out on track and show the new Mustangs <laughs> what an old car can do, even. Though this one is really using technology that you could have oh, yeah. built, you could have built a car like this. Oh yeah, this this is all old classic technology. A lot of people will take these cars and radically change them, trying to make them into a modern Mustang. But 
you can get by with uh, the old technology from the 60s and have something that can still contend with Mustangs of today. So over here is a 1994 Indianapolis 500 pace car uh, con convertible. I think these were all convertibles, weren't they? That's correct. And the, the 1994 model was the first model of this body style. And they probably bid, bid for the Indy pace car to present the world this car and let everyone see it. I'm sure they did. Yeah, that's the reason it was the pace car because it was a whole new body style and platform for the uh, for the uh, for the Mustangs. And this car wouldn't have actually been on the track as a pace car. Those were actually a different set of cars. And what one major difference was that those cars had a roll bar. Yeah. Yes. This uh, I believe they made a thousand replicas of the real pace cars, and this is. I don't remember what number this one is, but this is one of those replicas. Yeah, the original stickers don't come on this car. They allow the owner to put them on if they wish. Um, and then there's also a plaque in front of the shifter that tells you what number this car is of that run of special Mustangs. And next to the pace car, we have a car that looks a little out of place in your collection, a 69 Camaro convertible. Why is this here? Well, as you know, I've always been a Mustang guy. My first two cars I ever owned were 65 and 66 Mustangs, and I always liked the looks of the Camaro, and of course, uh, this one has a 396 that could come with the big block power, and I saw this at, at an auction, and it was actually, cosmetically, the nicest looking Camaro at auction, even though it wasn't the highest price, because there were some of the special versions like uh, Nikki uh, Camaros and that kind of thing. So I ended up buying it. Um, I shouldn't have bought it because I don't drive it. I, when I got it here, it's, I drove it a little bit, but it's too nice to drive. That's the problem with this car. Um, so I really should should sell it. Uh, it's, it's a nice car, but I don't really need it. So the main reason you don't drive it isn't because it's a Camaro. It's because you feel this one is so nicely restored that you wouldn't want to get a rock chip or get it dirty or have to clean it up or anything like that. That's right. This was fresh and restored when I bought it. I've driven it very few miles. I fixed a couple oil leaks, uh, so it's actually better than when I bought it. But um, I just haven't gotten around to, to trying to uh, sell it. Uh, um, that's the story of it. So this is the Ford Bronco that you, you haven't owned this one very long. Uh, about three years, something like that. What year is the Bronco? This is a 1970. And you bought this from the guy that restored this. He was a body man. Right. And did a really nice body work and paint job on this. And he also upgraded the engine, so this has a 351 in it now. I don't, I don't think Broncos ever came with 351. No, they didn't, and uh, a lot of people have put 351 Windsors in them. This actually has a 351 Cleveland engine in it, which would be quite unusual. So when you bought this car, it looked great, but he was a body guy, not necessarily a mechanic, and you've had to do a lot of work to this mechanically since you bought it. Yeah, it, uh, it had loose... Uh, uh, the uh, kingpin bearings, uh, this one wheel over here was really floppy and would vibrate it pretty bad at about 45 miles an hour. So I replaced these and this engine I think came out of the truck because it had a truck style four speed floor shifter which Ford never put floor shift transmissions in, in these uh, early Broncos. Uh, and I decided to put a uh, uh, five-speed transmission in this just to make it more drivable because it, it has a 410 rear axle so it really revs fast on the highway. It's got a lot of power. I think it would go 100 miles an hour, but it's not safe to drive it that fast. I'll guarantee you that because it's like driving a billboard down the road. <laughs> and even though this looks nice, you've actually brought this out to some of the Jeep Club events and you've taken this out through the wood trails and everything like that, so luckily this doesn't just sit here in the garage and not get used, even though it is such a good looking truck. Yeah, this is one that I'll take out for a pleasure drive in the summertime. Uh, yeah, I've done a little bit of off-roading. I, 
obviously been careful not to scratch it up or get it terribly dirty, but, uh, but yeah, I've taken it uh, on some of your off-road drives. Is this one of the favorite vehicles that you own? Yeah, I would say I like this one. I had a 1975 Bronco back in the uh, in the 19 late 70s. Uh, it had been lifted, uh, had bigger tires than this one. Uh, it just didn't drive good on the highway, and uh, so I didn't keep it too long. But but I, I always like like the early Broncos, uh, the looks, and, and certainly their off road capability. The one I had back then, I had I had taken it out. And, some river bottoms and some hills and was pretty amazed with its off-road capability. And you've actually now pre-ordered one of the new Broncos. Yeah, I have one of the, the new two-door full-size Broncos on, on order that I probably won't get till later this year, maybe next year. Moving on from the Bronco is a, another vehicle kind of from your past. This is a 1970 Chevelle and you own one of these years ago as well. Yes, I had a 1970, this color, um, the autumn gold with the black stripes. It was an SS 454, and it was actually the 450 horsepower LS engine. It had an automatic transmission, it had a 410 rear axle, so it was a real tire burner. And I traded a 66 Mustang on that car, which, uh, certainly a car like this doesn't drive like a sporty Mustang, but it was a it was a real tire burner and of course these 70 Chevelles are real classic. They're one of the more popular Chevelle body styles and I always liked it myself. So you know the history of this car. I managed to buy a rust-free California car that was just a plain Jane Malibu that was a lime green car, 307 engine automatic transmission. You transformed the body into the SS paint scheme and so on. And then I put in a 572 crate engine. I started with an automatic transmission, but decided I didn't like that. So two winters ago, I spent a winter putting in a T56 six-speed transmission in this car. And that makes it a lot more fun to drive. Let's open the hood and take a look at that big engine. Yeah, it's it's quite a monster. It's a it's a it's a big block, and you might call it an extra big block. I mean, these are these are built by Chevrolet. I'm sure not in the factory. I'm sure they have some specialty uh, company put them together for them. But uh, yeah, it's it's quite a monster motor. It's uh, it's rated at 620 horsepower, but I actually detuned it a little bit went to a dual plane uh, manifold versus the single plane that it came with. And I actually uh, put a different cam in it. Uh, the, uh, I put the cam that would be coming 502 crate engine. So uh, because it's big cubic inches, it's got the torque, but it's, it's just a little more docile engine to drive on the street. Back when you met my mom, you were at your first job out of college, I think. And you actually owned a 1970 Chevelle, the Sunbeam Tiger, and a, the Fiat 850, not, not the one that we saw today, but mm -hmm. one like it all at the same time. And that's those were the cars that you were driving when you met my mom. Right. Yeah, I was single and had three cars. <laughs> but an interesting story is that Red Tiger over there, when I moved from Illinois to Iowa, I towed it with the 70 Chevelle that I had back then with a bumper tow bar type of a thing. And, uh, Which look, just clamped around the chrome bumper right, on the front of the Tiger. Right. And when I got here to Iowa and I was disconnecting the Tiger, I realized, oh, the front bumper of the Tiger is about ready to come off. So over here is your De Tomaso Pantera. Uh, we were at a Mika Mansion, the same one where you've got the Camaro and I bought a MG Midget race car at that auction and we were kind of looking through the ads and uh, I think both of us really liked this car and you did end up getting it. Uh, this is a pretty special Pantera because this is all original and very low miles. 
Yes, this is a 19,000 original mile car. I can't prove it. Uh, these tires are either originals or um, replacements of originals because the, uh, the date code is, is for year four. This is a 1974. Um, now, they don't look like they have 19,000 miles on them, so maybe somebody had custom wheels or maybe somebody replaced them with uh, some new old stock uh, uh, Goodyear or Rebus, because I don't think these tires were available in the 1980s. So I don't, maybe they were, but I question whether these could be even 1984 tires, because this, this uh, Goodyear or Reva tire, which were original equipment, uh, I don't think was around for very many years. But because of the way the date codes work, where they don't show the year, there is no way to prove that these are not the correct year tires for this car. Right, that's correct. Did, have you always liked Panteras? Oh yeah, I used to see them at the Shelby Club event. Uh, and, I, and I always liked the looks of them and always drooled over them but couldn't afford to buy one back then. And of course, this one I can't really afford to drive much because of its originality. This is probably the one, well, this one other car are the only two cars I would say that I could get more money out of them now, significantly more than I paid for them. And of course, if these tires really are from 1974, you definitely wouldn't want to be driving very quickly on these tires. They could just come apart and then ruin the bodywork and you'd have a big mess. So it, w it would not be worth driving this car at least with the tires that are on it now. That's correct, you wouldn't. And I have driven it very well. It's, it stayed in the garage here uh, most of the time. And of course, these are powered by a Ford 351. These were probably sold at Ford dealers? And they were sold through Lincoln Mercury dealers, actually, not at Ford dealers. But yes, they're, they're powered by a Ford uh, 351 Cleveland four-barrel engine. One of the funny things about this car you open the engine cover, all you've got is a giant storage area. You can't really see any of the engine and the transaxle sits underneath the, the storage pod here. So you actually have to pull this out of the car to get to anything. And you've worked on this car a little bit. It's probably kind of a pain to work on these. What you do is you get some cushions and you put them down in there and then you, because I had to rebuild the carburetor once and then you sit on the on the transmission between the, the fender well and the, 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 the transaxle is, is under this uh, luggage area here. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a pain, but at least you can get to it. You just have to sit in there to do it. So who made this transaxle? Uh, it's ZF, that's a German gearbox manufacturer that's still in the uh, gearbox and automotive uh, components business today. And obviously you're a fan of the Ford engine, but the rest of the car is really all Italian. It probably has Italian electrics, not 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 the Ford units. That's so correct. Working on this car, you'll be dealing with all uh, uh, Italian mechanicals and electrical bits and things like that. Right, yeah. Other than the Ford engine, it's all European components. And the body, of course, was made by De Tommaso in, in Italy. And these are not fiberglass cars, these are an all steel body? Yes, this is, this, this is steel. So we have a big trunk in the back of the car. What's sitting up here in the front? Uh, just a spare tire and a battery and a brake booster and looks like the windshield washer pump. And there's no room for luggage up here unless you put something in the center of the spare tire there. It's a space saver spare to fit in there. This actually isn't the end. We've got a couple more cars on the other side of the wall here. That's right. Okay, in this room we have a 1970 Boss 302 and a 1967 Mustang convertible. You've owned both of these cars for a long time as well. And this Boss 302 you actually bought from a restorer who was proficient in doing shell beats. And I think this was a project that one of his employees had on his own and this is a very very nicely restored car yes it's a show quality restored car that's why it's in this room uh, this car has been driven very little since i got it uh, because it is a, a high quality 
restoration. Um, actually got it from the shop that, uh, Shelby restoration shop that built the engine for the blue Mustang. And I've always been a fan of the old Boss 302s. I had actually driven a used one when I was in college thinking about trading my 66 Mustang, but it was just more money than, than I could afford to spend at the time. And you have actually driven this car a little bit, but it doesn't quite live up to what your dreams were about the car. Sometimes it's better not to have owned your dream car because <laughs> it doesn't end up being what you had dreamed about. Well, in stock street form, these were not awesome performance cars. They, they were very high revving, but uh, because they had cylinder heads with large uh, ports in them, they didn't have good low-end torque. Now, on the racetrack, they, they could put out 450 horsepower at high RPM when they were significantly modified, but these actually were not great drivable streetcars in their day. This would have been a direct competitor to the Z28 Camaros. They were also 302 cubic inch engines that were very, very high, high revving uh, engines. This is, these cars are one of the first cars that I know of that actually came from the factory with a rev limiter because people, uh, I'm sure there would be many owners that would blow them up or maybe that did blow them up if they disconnected the rev limiter because of these uh, are extremely high revving engines. So you've owned this car for a number of years and you do take it to Mustang shows and you've entered it into concourse judging once or twice and it, this car does at least get out where people can see it. It's not like it hides in here completely. Yeah, I've taken it to shows a couple times. And then over here, the 1967 convertible this is a car that you've done quite a bit of work to as well. Uh, yeah, this is restored to pretty much uh, stock condition. This came with a tired engine that wasn't, wasn't original to the car. Um, and I think this engine actually came in the blue 66 Mustang, which of course is not original engine for this car, but it was closer to the correct date code for this car. And this car had been wrecked on this corner. Um, and this car has not been rusty, and I think it must have sat around quite a number of years, perhaps, perhaps wrecked before somebody restored it. But the, the inner fender back there was really crunched up. So I pulled the engine, took the fenders off. I, I got replacement inner fenders and, and fixed that. I pulled the completely stripped the interior out. I could see where the floor was wavy or it had been hit hard from this kind of direction. It's uh, And it's a highly optioned. It has the original air conditioning, which of course we put on new hoses and charges it up, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't work hardly at all, I don't think. Uh, it had the deluxe interior, so it's, uh, uh, it was a, it was a pretty fancy car for, the 1967, not a real high performance car. It was originally uh, a four barrel 289 car, which it still is today. So you did all that work to the inner fenders and stripped it all down and did all that without damaging any of this exterior paint. You haven't had this repainted at all. Right, yeah, it's got the paint on it that, that came on it, which, was a, which is a good quality paint job. Well, thanks for letting us come in here and take a look at your garage. and. Thanks for teaching me a lot of what I know about cars, and I know that you supported uh, my appetite a little bit for me loving cars so much growing up, and I always had car toys to play with and tractor toys and things like that, and you definitely helped me out with the first cars that I had. Uh, my first British car, the 1969 Sprite, you helped me do a lot of the work on that. I yeah. had started that and I think I ran into some things that were a little bit over my head at the time and you helped me uh, figure those out. So thanks for that. Yeah, you're welcome, no problem. It's, it's nice to have a son who, uh, who likes to do this kind of stuff like I do. So if you wanna see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe.